Well, in, in lieu of an ordinary joke, this is a true story that happened to one of our members. It's not a ha-ha, but more like, oh, so cute. But I, I, I liked it anyway. The daughter of Jeremiah and Brittany, Kairos, was having her eyes checked. Since she could not spell or read, they showed her shapes. They showed her a square, and she said, square, that's a circle, heart. Then they showed her this, and she smiled and said, Jesus. And there she is, Carol, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Isn't she adorable, amen. All right, lift up our Bibles real high and say this. Say, this is my Bible. It is the Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I have what it says I have. I boldly declare that my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and my cell phone is off. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, did you hear that child of God? Turn to someone. Did you hear that child of God? You will never, ever, ever be the same again. I believe it. You're not going to be the same again. Well, God bless you. You look marvelous. If you would, open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. And now, Heavenly Father, as we open up our Bible, we do pray for traveling mercies and all those in the Thanksgiving weekend, all of our members traveling back home, their family members traveling back home, and also our family members who are on the road, give them traveling grace, have your angels to be encamped around them, keep them safe on their journey, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, open our hearts to receive the word of God. Enable me to speak it the way I ought to, and I thank you, Lord, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 4, let's begin with the third verse. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. The old version says you must master it. What's the sin? Anger. If you don't master anger, anger will master you. There is nothing inherently wrong in anger. It's not a sin. If it was a sin, then God would not have told Cain, sin is at the door, because he was already angry. So if anger is a sin, sin is not at the door. It's already in his heart. Isn't that right? I mean, because you're angry doesn't mean you sin. But if you don't learn to rule over it, if you don't learn to master it and control it, the world, they talk about anger management. And what a management is the manager. That's the person in charge. And, and the idea is you need to learn to master anger because if you don't, it's going to master you. See, anger is meant to be your ally, provided it is also your servant. But once anger becomes your master, it ceases to be your ally. It becomes your enemy. And for some of you, anger has been an enemy to your life. Anger is ruining your financial opportunities. Anger is ruining your marriage. Anger is ruining your relationship with your children, with your parents. Anger is ruining your fitting in to the body of Christ. Anger is controlling you, and, and, and as long as it controls you, it's not going to be an ally. It's not going to be a friend. It's going to be an enemy, and it's going to ruin your life. 
We don't have to hardly read any further, but you know the story. Cain did not rule over anger. He allowed anger to come into him. It attacked him, and then he attacked his brother and killed him. Ultimately, when you hear all of these mass killings, those mass killings are, are done because people are angry. And they go out and, and they kill because the anger has mastered them. So is anger mastering you or are you mastering it? Now, anger, I said, could be an ally. See, you need some element of anger because God, the Bible says God gets angry. He gets angry because he's holy and righteous. He's good and loving. So when he sees unholiness and he sees people hurting each other, automatically he gets angry. But that anger is God's ally to help fix the situation, to correct, to do what needs to be done to make people better people. For example, a boss needs to have some element of anger. If he hears that he lost customers, he needs to get to the bottom of it. He has to get angry and say, I don't want to lose customers. What's going on? And he gets to the bottom of it because his anger leads him to figure out how can we better serve our customers. If he launches a new product and that product doesn't perform like he wanted it to, he has to get angry. He has to find out what's the problem. Who was it in charge of this? What did they do to, to, to fail on this product? And so he has to bring in people who made a mistake because what is he doing? He wants to put out a product that blesses people, that helps people. So anger is the ally to the boss. A parent has to have some anger. Surely a parent has to be angry if he finds out his child is smoking. His child is playing hooky at school. The child's hanging around the wrong crowd. Getting bad grades. Surely a parent can't just, cannot be just ambivalent toward that. A, a parent has to be angry because they're wanting to figure out what do we do to, what can I do to fix my child so that they be, be, become better and have a more successful life. But, but if a parent is just ambivalent, I don't care, I don't feel any anger, then they just don't even correct anything. A pastor has to feel anger when his own members don't live right. When they do wrong things, they hurt others. They're not walking in love. Surely I can't sit back as a pastor, nor can any pastor watching this by television. They can't sit back and say, well, things happen. No, there has to be some anger. Jesus had anger enough to clear out the money changers when he saw that they turned God's house into a temple rather than a place of prayer. He got angry when he saw his disciples keeping children from coming to Jesus. Yes, he got angry when he saw the hard, hard hearts of the Pharisees who kept people in bondage through rules that didn't benefit people. He got angry, the Bible says. So anger... If it's controlled, if it is your servant, becomes a great ally for constructive living. But once anger becomes your master, then you're no longer in control of anger. Anger is now controlling you. And now it becomes destructive. And that's where some of you are at right now. It's destroying, destroying your life and your loved ones and your finances, and your health, everything's going down because anger is controlling you. For some of you, you, you can't imagine anger not being a sin. But be honest, who, who, before you heard this series of messages, who thought that anger itself was a sin? Be honest, yeah, God bless you, be honest. you. But it's not, because if it's a sin, God's been sinning a lot, Right? The Bible talks about God's anger. So because we think it's a sin, you know what we do? We start to deny we have it. Oh, you, are you angry? No, I'm not angry. I'm just upset. <laughs> a rose by any other name is still a rose. No, I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. That's another one. I'm not angry, I just don't like it when people treat me that way. It's still anger. But the reason why you try to deny the anger is because you, you brought, you're brought up thinking anger itself is always wrong. So you got to deny that you have it because then you're admitting a weakness or a sin on your part. But God never told Cain, who was very angry, right? Cain was very angry. 
God still said sin is at the door. It hasn't come in yet. So God wasn't condemning him for his anger, but he was saying you better master it or sin will attack you and destroy you. Now, let me prove this to you a little bit more that anger itself is not a sin. Listen to the New Testament about anger. Galatians 5.20. Read this scripture out loud with me. This is the works of the flesh. Ready? Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy. What's the next one? What is it? Fits of rage. Notice the work of the flesh, sin, is not anger, but fits of rage. Anybody ever had a fit? I had one coming down to church. Well, I hope before you took communion, you repented. People have it. They, they blow up. Fits. But if anger itself was a sin, why would he talk about fits of rage? He would have simply said anger as a work of the flesh. But it's not. But it is when... And when someone has a fit, you know what's happening? They're not in control of anger. When you see your little kid having a fit, crying, throwing a temper tantrum, I want that bicycle, and they start, that anger has controlled your child. The child's not controlling it. It's a fit. And some of you, you're still crying like a baby. I want what I want, but now it's not a bicycle. I want that car. I want that dress. I don't care if I have to borrow money. No, 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 no. Fits of rage. So it, anger's not a sin, but when it's controlling you, 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 you have a fit. Here's another New Testament scripture, 2 Corinthians 12, 20. From afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be. And you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy. What's the next one? Outburst of anger. Not anger, but outburst. Outburst is when the anger controls you. It's mastering you, and you have an outburst. You yell, you scream. See, and that's an outburst. Anger itself is not a sin. Otherwise, he would have simply said anger. Instead, he says it's the outburst. So God created you with a sense of holiness, a sense of righteousness, a sense of, of what is right and what is wrong. And when you see injustice level against you or your loved ones, it's natural to feel anger. What I want to teach you to do is do what God does. He controls his anger. You can control it. Let's look at the three bad ways that people hander, handle anger in their life. And you don't want to handle it this way. The first bad way that people deal with anger is they withdraw. I haven't yelled at her. Yeah, but you haven't talked to your wife in three days. Because I'm not yelling at her. Why are you not talking to her? You know why you're not talking to her? You're angry at your wife. You withdraw. So what people will do is they will withdraw. They'll give the silent treatment. People who are angry at members in the church or even at moi, the bishop, you know what they'll do? They'll stop going to church. Oh, I'm not angry. Why you stop? Where you no longer, some of you, you're no longer attending family functions. Some of you did not go to your mom's house for turkey. Why? Well, I just didn't feel like it. Don't lie. You're angry. So you're withdrawing from your family that you're supposed to honor and be with. You were drawn from your church. You're, some of you withdraw from people at work. You won't talk to them. What are you doing? You're withdrawing from them. You're pulling away. You can't do this. This is not the proper way to handle anger. As I was preparing this, I, I thought about when I was around 12 years old, 11, 12. 
I was, I love baseball. I was a really good baseball player and uh, always, you know, first string in baseball. Always the first batter. I had the leading batting record. I mean, I, I just was good at that sport. One summer, I was on a vacation with my family and I missed the, the week of practice and games. And when I came back I, uh, to, to El Paso, I, I had rushed quickly to where the game was at and got there at the game. And for the first time, the, the coach benched me for the entire game. I didn't get to play. Now, he was right in benching me. You know why? I wasn't there for practice. I wasn't there for a week. And just me coming in, he would send a wrong message that it doesn't matter what you do for the whole week. We're going to put you as first string, right? But he benched me. I remember thinking how angry I was after the game was over that I didn't get to play. This has never, never happened to me before. And I remember being angry. But you know what I did not do? I did not tell the coach I'm angry. I did not tell my friends I was angry. Instead, the next day I called up the coach and said, uh, Coach, um, I just got to let you know I'm quitting the baseball team. See, what am I doing? I'm withdrawing. He goes, why? You can't quit. We, you, we, you play every year. No, you, we need you. He goes, no, no, Coach. Uh, here's the thing. I have so many vacations I'm going to be attending. Yeah, like, right. That was my one and only summer vacation. My family wasn't exactly rich where we went on vacation every week. This was it. And when we went on vacation, we didn't stay at hotels. We stayed with relatives. Anybody know where I'm talking about? We didn't have money. What do you mean, Marriott? No, it was Uncle John. That was our Marriott. So, but I'm lying. What I'm doing is I'm withdrawing but because I'm angry that I didn't get to play. The next day, three guys come over to my house and say, Tom, you, uh, these are the baseball players. you got to come back. I heard you quit. You can't quit. We need you. And here's what I said. No, you don't need me. You have plenty of players. Anybody ever done that? But what am I doing? I'm angry. But I'm not being honest. And I quit. As I look back, that was so stupid of me to quit. Because on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays when we had our game, I'm at home bored. Well, everyone's having fun playing baseball, and I could be out there. But anger caused me to lose out on a season of baseball. If I was just honest and said to my coach, Coach, I'm angry. Why didn't you play me? You know I'm, a, I'm one of the better players. You know what he would have said? Tommy, I know you are, but you cannot skip a whole week of baseball and just come in because I'm going to send the wrong message that practice is not important. But you stay, you practice on Monday, you'll play on Tuesday. Then I would have got a lesson. Oh, I see. And I would have learned something. But what did I do? I didn't want to talk. I just wanted to be angry. Some of you, that's what you're doing. You're withdrawing from people. You're angry, but you don't want to talk it out. And I'm here to tell you, you have to talk it out. I find it interesting. You know what Cain did? When God says, why are you angry? He never told God why. He did not talk. He withdrew. And that's what some of you are doing. Now, withdrawing is not the same as taking a cooling period. Sometimes it's wise when you're angry to say, look, 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 honey, I'm angry right now. We'll talk in a few, uh, in an hour or so, but let me cool down. I'm not ready to talk because I don't want to say anything I don't want to, that I'll regret. You know, it's okay to take a cooling off period, but it's not the same as withdrawing. It's like, I'm angry, let me cool down, let me calm down. Did you know God did that? One of the funniest stories of the entire Bible is when God is talking to the Israelites who are rebelling, they're stiff-necked, they just don't listen to God. And you know what God says? Go on ahead and I'll meet you at the promised land. Listen to why God says, I'm not going to be with you. You go on and I'll meet you over there. Listen to this passage, Exodus 33, 3. God says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, 
but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. You don't want me to be with you. <laughs> now, if God has a cooling off period, he's doing this to teach you something that just as God could get angry, he knows you, sometimes you just kind of break, separate a little bit just for a time. He didn't say, I'll never be with you. He just says, you go on to the promised land. I'll meet you there because I don't want to be with you because if I'm with you, you're going to do something and I'm just going to destroy you all. There it is. I, I knew I shouldn't have been with them. I should have cooled off. I told you. I mean, so listen, if God needs cooling off period, I, I, need, I need it big time. So sometimes it's all right to cool off. Count. You all remember your, your mom taught you when you're angry, count to ten. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Because I'm mad as a hot tamale. Some of you need to count to a hundred. Ten's not enough. Some of you need to count to a thousand. And some of you are so angry, you need to count to a thousand backwards. But this is not the same. See, cooling off, taking a break is not the same as withdrawing from people. All right, it's different. The second bad way that people handle anger is through passive-aggressive actions. Passive-aggressive. What is passive-aggressive? It's indirect resistance. Now, see, a passive-aggressive person won't yell, won't even tell someone that they're angry. What they'll do is in a roundabout way they will punish the person they're angry with but they'll do it in an indirect way all right for example the husband is angry because his wife is not having sex with him and he's thinking what's wrong what's wrong with her what's wrong with me and, and he's getting uptight he's getting angry I mean I married her I can't believe we're not what's wrong with her she always has a headache she's this that blah, blah, blah. always have an excuse so he doesn't bring it up because he's a macho man. So what he'll do, he'll punish his wife in indirect ways. So when the wife says, honey, honey, could you help change the diaper? He pretends he didn't hear his wife. Honey! See, he starts to punish her for not giving him what he wants. Some of you, now this is a very subtle way, some of you you're doing this, but it's going to take a lot of deep thought to help you understand this. Church members do this. They'll, if they're upset with someone in the church, they'll show up late for church. You are watching The Bondage Breaker with Bishop Tom Brown. To receive today's message in its entirety, call us now at 915-855-WORD. That's 915-855-9673. If you prefer to request the message by mail, then follow the information on the screen and don't forget to specify today's title. Bishop Brown's ministry of spiritual deliverance is well known in America and around the world. His message of freedom and victory in Christ is found in his best-selling books. Come by Word of Life Church for an autographed copy. Word of Life Church has a first-class children's ministry with small classrooms so children have more individual attention. Children also get to enjoy one of the largest indoor playgrounds in the city. Many parents are concerned for their teenagers. Be at ease. Here at Word of Life Church, your teenagers will feel like they are a part of a group of youth that are truly committed to Christ. You won't find better music anywhere in El Paso than by our church band. Our talented musicians and singers will lift your spirits up to God as they play the latest music while incorporating the great classical hymns. Fellowship is important to us, so we have provided a relaxing atmosphere in our expanded coffee shop. Enjoy a latte or fresh pastry while you make new friends. Word of Life Church believes in helping those in need. Word of Life quietly helps provide food, clothing, and aid to the needy. Visit us at Word of Life Church and make a positive difference, not only in your own life, but the lives of others. 
Word of Life Church meets every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. for Spanish. Bible study is on Tuesday at 7.15 p.m. The church meets at 11675 Pratt Avenue. That's near the intersection of Pebble Hills and Saul Kleinfeld across from Walmart. For more information about this spirit-filled church, call 855-9673. That's 855-WORD.